viewer Jenna sent in a new project and uh, <laughs> you're looking at it going, oh, you gotta be kidding me, right? Look at that little tiny thing, that simple little object. Jenna told me that she attempted to mold and cast this piece and she did not find it simple. And you know what? Jenna was right because to me, one of the most interesting things about projects like this is on the surface, it looks really, really easy to do. But in fact, it presents a lot of really interesting complexities and challenges that we're going to have to overcome because she wants 12 perfect copies of this painted gold in bright, shiny gold. One of the first things we need to address is the bone itself. As you can see, if you look closely, it's quite porous and rough, and there's a very sharp edge down in that Y. We need to make 12 of these castings, and the mold would probably last. But in those pores, see those tiny little pores in there? Uh, the rubber would fill in there, but they would break off uh, those little details. And so you'd have these little, little bits of rubber sticking into the castings. Same thing here on the end of the bone. You can see how rough it is and how it has uh, holes and things that it would be very smart of us to fill and smooth a little bit uh, just to make a more durable mold. Originally, I intended to only cast the wishbone by itself, but then I remembered I had this little object I wanted to cast, and it was a perfect opportunity to show you guys that you can gang different objects together in one mold and very successfully cast them. So we're gonna position that piece about like that. I built the mold box out of heavy cardboard, and to seal it up, I just put packing tape on the insides. And by the way, the easy way to do that is you put packing tape over a big sheet of cardboard and then you cut the parts out. You don't put the packing tape on afterwards. It just makes it easier. I've already begun to glue it together, but I wanted to show you how the piece is positioned in the mold about like that. I'm leaving a pretty good generous amount of rubber around it because that's going to be the cut plane. And I want to make sure that I have a nice cut plane. Now the sprues I simply made out of epoxy sculpt. And the reason they look like this is they're designed to fit to the pieces. When you, when you shape a, a funnel and a sprue to the object you're casting, it can save you a lot of cleanup time later. The modifications I'm gonna do to this are simple enough. I'm just gonna come into the roughest parts and just give them a light coating of wax. Just take these rough areas and give them a light coating of wax. That's not going to be visible. A little bit. Ow, 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 ow. Okay, so I did that. Just making sure that I'm not going to have too much porosity at the end of this. Just, I'm really, really heating the wax so it fills in, runs into those cracks really nicely. Okay, beautiful. That's gonna make a difference. Just that little bit is gonna help. There's some little holes in here to fill. Get those filled. Got them filled up. We're all ready to go to position this stuff. Let's do it. Let's get this stuff in place. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put hot wax on my, I'm gonna heat the wax onto my sprues. Get a nice little bit of wax going in there. Get this going in there, and let's just see if we can't position this stuff in place. Okay, that's on. That's not quite on, but it's gonna be. Let's see if I can put the wax down in there. There we go. Now these pieces are gonna be quite delicate, especially in the beginning. Now, let's See if we can't get a sprue going in there. Because I have these things propped up, it really makes it easier to weld everything together than it otherwise would. Let me put a dollop of sticky wax on there. Stick that on there. And cut that off like that. Very good. Got that one into position. Let's do the same thing down in here. that into position. Let's get a little more sticky wax on there. Put that on there. Okay. 
Okay. Now I'm going to switch to my sculpting wax. So you get the idea. I'm just going to use wax to build up the connections between the parts, between the model and the parts. Like that. And that tail is quite a bit out of alignment, so I'll be going down with that like that. I might even move the whole thing down. I think I'm going to move the whole thing down. Okay. Now, the question is, is it going to hold up? That's the big question. I think it will. Look at that. All right. Nice. I got it to stand up. I need to be super careful because right now it's pretty fragile. But it will hold it up, and we will finish welding it on there. Here's the piece, beautifully waxed up and looking good. Got them all connected up. All right, so it's all ready to go. So now, here is our mold case. And what we're gonna do is just pop it on there like that. Super easy. So now what I'm gonna do is go around with the, with the handy blob of sticky wax. Come on, come along here and just sticky wax it into place. Little bit of sticky wax. Then I'm going to show you another trick. Momentarily, as soon as I get this thing sticky wax. Now I could go around and wax the whole thing into position. Chew up a lot of wax, actually. That's one way I could do it. But there are other ways. Right now what I'm doing is I'm just tacking the case to the base with sticky wax. Not really looking to fully seal it with wax. Just gonna do it like that. I didn't get it on camera, but I used a combination of oil clay and sticky wax to seal the case to the base. As you can see, I already poured a small batch in the bottom. And what that did was it sealed up the edges down below. Hardly had any leakage. But it's always a good idea to put a little bit in the bottom, you know, half an inch in the bottom or so. Let that gel. And uh, now I know that I'm not going to have any leaks out the bottom. And I can pour the bulk of the, of the mix. So let's do that now. What do I always do? Pour from the bottom. So I want this rubber to fall all the way down to the bottom of the box. Just fill it, fill it, fill it. So I'm really pouring at a high rate now because I'm able to pour all the way to the bottom and the rubber is running over the forms. It's not trapping any air and it's filling up super nice. Filling from the bottom up as always. Now as I get toward the end, I may want to stir a little bit to make sure I have well mixed rubber. Don't want any unmixed rubber coming up. And who knows, maybe I'll come up a hair short, maybe I'll make it. It's going to be close, I can tell already. I don't have any scrap rubber that I can pump in there. Don't have my scrap rubber bin with me. So if I come up a little short, I'll have to mix up a small batch of topper. It's not the first time in my life I would have to mix up a topping batch, but I'd, I'd rather have to mix a topping batch, quite frankly, than have a lot of rubber left over in the cup. Because boy, you hate to waste this stuff. Ooh, so expensive. Okay, we're getting down towards the end here. Let's see how we do. Let's see how we're gonna do. It's gonna be really, really close. I see about less than a quarter of an inch of bone sticking up. So boy, oh boy, is it gonna be close. I think we're just about gonna make it. We're just going to make it. Talk about getting it. <laughs> Talk about having exactly the right amount. I mean, I'm a pretty good guesser. But that was pretty good even for me. Nothing left in the cup. Oh, I'm pretty pleased about that, let me tell you. Not gonna lie, I would have been bummed out to have to have mixed up another batch. Wouldn't have killed me, but I would have been bummed out anyway. All right, the bubbles you're looking at there come from the scraping of the cup. Uh, all that was de-aired well. Let's just blow them out. As you can see, you can just blow on and pop them and, and they'll pop right out. 
All right, good. Done. It's the next day and it's time to cut the mold. Let's see what we got. Start just by trimming off the tape a little bit. Took the paper off the table because I don't like cutting open molds with paper on the table. Makes it harder. All right, let's see what we got here. This is why I like sticky wax compared to hot milk glue. Ding! See how that popped off? Look at this. Ding! I just... It's such a breeze to take molds apart. They work, they bond together great, but they come apart easy. Everything's about easy. Same thing here. Everything just, everything just pops off. Neat as you please. So easy to take molds apart. Ah, oh, nice. That, that's looking good. Now I taped the bottom, it didn't cut it. Let's go ahead and cut that. Okay. There's some of the oil clay that I used to seal up the base with. You can see that. All right, now I'm gonna break the sprues, break the connections. That might be a little bit harder because it is harder. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, there we go. All right, you can see the oil clay. Boy, that looks good. There's the bottom of the, of the funnels. There's, this job is purely cosmetic, but I like doing it anyway. The, the flaps bug me, so I just go around with the scissors and I just cut off, kind of clean up the mold, cut off the flash. Uh, it just makes the mold look a little tighter and neater, easier to handle. I don't have these dingleberries hanging off it. Same with the top. This is not a precision job, just nicking off. All right, looking good. Okay. Boy, that's a nice tight little mold. Very nice. We're gonna build a case for it, of course, because it's too floppy by itself. It's got big flat sides and it's way too floppy. I'm not just gonna rubber band it. You're not gonna get the sufficient even pressure that we wanna see. Let's cut it open. All right, let's cut this mold. See how we do. Start on this end. What I like to do usually is to see if I can pop the funnels out easily. Pop that funnel out. See if this funnel, funnel will pop out. Yes, it will. I like to pop the funnels out because by popping the funnels out, you uh, get your landmarks, you get your bearings, you can see where you need to go. And that is good. So let's start this cut. Nice and jaggedy, always. Cut between this web. Now I'm cutting out between the two funnels, making sure I follow the vent down, which I did. Okay, you can see I'm following the bone down, so I, when I'm away from the part, I try to cut jagged. When I'm on the part, I try to cut neat. It's just always the way to do it. Cut neat at the model, jagged away from the model. And let's cut to this vent over here. Okay, very good. Now I'm cutting along the back of the bird to the handle on the back of the bird, which I'm almost to the point where I'm gonna cut through that. I'm cutting the bridge of rubber between, in the loop. I cut that handle out. That means I might be able to take that bird out of there. Right, I don't know if I can, not quite yet. And see, stretching is a very helpful technique for opening molds. Stretch that thing open. Uh, it, it really helps it to cut. Really helps it to cut. I did break the bone. I was wondering if I had broken it. I did. Okay, I thought I heard that thing go, but I wasn't sure. And now that bird should come out of there, and it did. Bird's out, that was neat and sweet, looking good. But I'm gonna have to cut all the way through that bird. That's one downside to having a, a gang type of mold, is I have to cut all the way through it. All the way through the bird, not all the way through the, the, the wishbone. Keeping in mind that the important project here is the client project, which is the wishbone. OK, 
Okay, so now we're coming down through and we want to find the other side of that wishbone. And to do that, we locate it at the, at the point where it enters the vent. So now I know where I'm aiming for as I cut. Still think it's better to cut it this way. Looks like I'm finding it pretty well. I think it's free now. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Got it. Slight casualty. <laughs> Sometimes models get broken. That's one thing about cut molds, is especially wax models, it's very, very common for me to break my models, getting, the, getting them out. Uh, that's just something you ex expect and something you uh, accept. There's some little chippies in there. We're gonna do a clean out cast. See what happens. All right. We have a cut mold. Beautiful. Now I'll build the case and we'll pour some resin. The mold is made, but it's uh, pretty floppy and pretty thin and pretty easy to knock over. What we need to do is we need to build a cradle for it, which I have done. Now you might say that's one of the rattiest looking things I've ever laid eyes on. And you'd be right. Um, what happened was that uh, <laughs> I glued it up wrong. And I've noticed that I glued it up wrong about two seconds before the epoxy set, tore the whole thing apart, and then I glued it back together. All I did was take the original mold case, these parts here, and added a couple of strips of cardboard to them, and they will stand up like that. I tapered the base so that it will drop into the tank. And so that's gonna fit really well. So then this goes in here, and this goes in here, and that, is gonna hold that neat and sweet. Now, one of the problems I'm gonna have is with the rubber bands, there might be a tendency. So by the way, this beam here, all that's doing is providing middle pressure, pushing this way into the mold to help hold the center of the thing. So I'm gonna get him, it's kinda of like making a, a round mold, but it's uh, instead of a round mold, I just have a, a beam in the center. Now let's see how this is gonna work out with the rubber bands. You could have an issue because of the tapering sides on the rubber band. I don't know that I will, but if you did have an issue and, it, and you felt like the rubber bands weren't gonna stay in place, one thing you could do uh, is just simply cut a little notch like this. Just notch the thing, just a littlest bit. It doesn't have to be much. So that, those two little notches will help the rubber band stay in place like that. Um, it's probably worth doing. Makes it easier and quick to assemble. And we'll go through there and put all of the bands on. And that's not gonna take a great many bands. The nice thing about having a cradle, one of the best things about having a cradle around your rubber is that you really don't need a tremendous number of rubber bands to hold the whole thing together. This is nice and handleable. It just works great. All right, I'm excited. It's time to pour some resin. Ready to pour the first pour into Jen's molds. Here I am in my home studio. What I've done is I've mixed up a 20 gram batch of A and a 20 gram batch of B. And let's just pour them together. I'm just gonna do a cup to cup pour so I know that I'm Getting it even. Okay. I expect I have a little more resin than I need, but we'll see. The first casting, you don't quite know. Mix it up good. Mix it up beauteous. Let's pour this boy. See how this does. Should run down there just fine. In the meantime, I'll pour the bird. Be very interesting to see if Jen's wishbone pours. Should pour just fine. You look at that, it's coming right up. Came right up the old flu. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I had a lot of extra. You know what I'll do? Just for fun, I'll take an old mold and fill it just to see what happens. Just almost enough to fill an old mold. 
If I have extra resin on the first shot, I'll fill an old mold or I'll fill a useful mold like a funnel or some other part that I use a lot, and it works really well. All right, so let's hustle this into the tank. All right, excitement time. Now there is a complexity to this casting that we're gonna investigate. This is nice and hard, but again, they're not rock hard. They're hard enough to demold, but they're not rock hard. And there is a complexity in casting Jen's project. And that complexity is that it, the parts are thin. It's a wishbone, you know, it's, it's a wishbone of a turkey. So it's a very skinny, narrow, long part. And what that means is, the bigger the mass you have, the faster it cures. So things that are in a small mass, for instance, this is 100% cured. But if you look at the resin that's on the stick, it's still sticky. This resin on the stick hasn't, it, it's tacky, it isn't cured. And that's because it's such a small mass of resin that it takes a long, long time. It will cure, but it takes a long, long time to cure. So that's still tacky. So that principle applies to these parts as well. Now here's the thing. I want you to see this wishbone come out of this mold. It's gonna be tricky to demold it, and here's why. It's gonna be really, really flexible and really floppy and really hard to demold and without distorting. So what I'm gonna have to do on all of these, I actually am gonna have to cut this mold more or I'm gonna have trouble getting them out of there. Let's cut this mold down a little bit. I'm having to cut this more than I would have liked and I'll pull it out. See what I mean? <laughs> See the problem? See how floppy it is? You could tie the thing into a knot. You have to cut off the sprue, and you have to cut off the vent, at least rough. I'm actually gonna cut it pretty close to what I want it to be. You have to cut that off so that the resin piece will relax itself and maintain its original shape. So it's super important when you pull it out of the mold that you don't distort it. So anytime you have parts like these, long, thin, fine parts, that's why car bodies are so hard to cast in this process. Anything, sheet metal, sheets of anything, anything that's very thin, very long and thin, anything like that is very tricky to cast in resin because you have to really, really, really let it sit in the mold for a long time to cure, or when you pull it out, you have to be super careful not to distort it or warp it or tear it when you pull it out. And then you have to set it in a way that it just final cures in itself perfectly. That wishbone came out just fine. There's no bubbles, there's no imperfections. It's gonna be just fine but it can be really tricky to cast thin pieces. This is the second shot, let's pull it out of the mold. Wanted to show you something, if you notice, you'll notice that I didn't pour the other cavity, the little bird piece. Um, if you gang pieces in a mold, you don't have to pour all of the pieces with every shot. You can just select which, wins, which pieces you wanna pour. That's really handy, like what if you need 12 of something and eight of another, or uh, the two projects are completely unrelated and you don't want to pour them together. You don't have to. In most cases, if you design the mold right, the uh, mold cavities are independent of one another. Sometimes they can even have entirely different cut patterns within the same mold, because remember, the great advantage to cut molds is that the cut patterns, the cut lines, don't necessarily have to hook together or link together or be related. You can just cut willy-nilly to get a mold open, and sometimes that works better than any other way. Let's see what we got in shot number two. Again, this is a very, 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 very soft and flexible part. So I'm being super careful not to hurt it, pulling it out of the wall. Look at that. <laughs> this happens with really small parts. The happy news is that resin has a really good memory for how it was cast. And it really does actually want to return to its 
proper form. You can bend it and flex it and do all kinds of stuff. And by the way, this is a really creative way to do something. You can make fantastically complex forms like spirals or really th things that are just impossible to cast by casting them flat and then taking them out soft and bending them and shaping them and holding them into position. Works like a champ. Maybe we'll do a project like that where I show that. It does work. And as you can see on this, on this project, Floppiness is an issue. So, but look at this first one. You'll see that it returned very nicely to shape. It wants to actually go back to the shape it was cast. And it sort of will relax in the correct shape. I just am kind of helping it along here but it will pretty much relax in the correct shape. Just give it a minute and it'll come back into shape. Part number two, looking good. No bubbles, no flaws. Look how little flash you see. I mean, there's a tiny, tiny amount of flash there. Look how clean those are. This is so great. It's just such a great, easy way to make stuff. Okay, that's two. Only 10 more to go, and we've got this job done. All right, beautiful. 12 wishbones, all ready to go. Now all we gotta do is clean them up. And there's not too much cleanup to be done. So that should go quick and easy. And let's get on to that next. Now we just need to clean the parting lines and the flash, and let me tell you, these things are pretty clean. Look at that. It's just, sometimes I find it's just easier to do it with a razor blade, easier and faster. There is very, very little in the way of parting lines on these pieces. They're super clean. Boy, they just clean right up. Alternatively, of course, I could just use some sandpaper, piece of sandpaper and run it over it. But in some ways, you know, I almost feel like sandpaper could potentially do more harm than good to these things. So I'm just as comfortable. Let's find one that has a lot of flash on it. And this is my definition of a lot of flash. As you can see, there's hardly any. And it just, just pops right off. Boy, I tell you what, I defy you kitties to show me a two-part mold with a clayed up parting line that gives you parting lines that look like this. See any parting lines on there? I'm, I'm standing here looking at it and I don't see any parting lines. I mean, they are about as invisible as it gets. Now we still have to clean up the ends, these little bits on the ends, but because the bone is so rough and uneven, I am inclined to do them I did this one already. I'm inclined to just do them on the bandsaw and just kind of make them rough and uneven just by cutting them on the bandsaw. And that's what I'm gonna do. But first, we're gonna finish up this job of just taking off the flash and looking for any visible parting lines at all that we might may want to smooth down. Boy, I'm not seeing a lot. I am not seeing a lot. They look great. Okay. I'm gonna go through, finish them up, get them all cleaned up, and the next thing we're gonna do is paint them. I got everything done at the bandsaw, and I just went over each piece with a little bit of sandpaper and just checked them and cleaned them and took off all the hairs and the dingleberries and the snurds and any other thing I could see. And now is the part that I'll either finish this piece and they'll look great, or I'll spray this on there. This is gold spray paint. Jenna wants these things to be gold. Doesn't want them in this sort of uh, pale yellow color. That was just uh, a random dye color that I picked. Figured yellow would be the best color to put under gold. Uh, can you hear me shouting over the... Uh, this... Uh, spray can and everything has been in the hot box. So it's nice and warm. So this is where I'm either gonna completely destroy these pieces and ruin a couple days of work, or we'll have a successful piece and we'll be done. Let's find out what's gonna happen.
Of course, I'm going to gas myself out. That goes without saying. Just trying to hit them from all different angles. Not at all certain how many coats I'm going to need to get a nice metallic finish, but they're already looking pretty good. Okay, I think I'm pretty pleased with those. What we'll do now is I'll put them in the hot box and let them dry, and then we'll flip them over and do the other side. I'm pretty pleased with how the first side came out. They are looking good. But now, let's do the back side. Hope they come out just as well. See how we do. Now those are looking pretty nice. All right. Well, this project's done, and I think it came out pretty good. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked this video, and if you did, uh, leave some comments down below. Don't forget to keep your projects coming. Keep your questions coming. You know I love hearing from you, and I will see you next week.